Hello, this is Camille Fairborn from Michigan State University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's cause teaching and learning webinar. I'm pleased to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Comiskey and Major Brian Adams as our presenters today. They are both assistant professors in the Department of Mathematical Sciences at West Point. For today's webinar, they will give a presentation entitled Causal Inference in Introductory Statistics Courses, Why, What, and How. The way the webinars work is that all listeners are muted during the webinar. You can ask questions at any time by typing them into the questions box, and we'll be sure to ask those questions towards the end and give our presenters a chance to respond. You can also use the chat box if you're having any technical questions. So at this point, I'll turn things over to our presenters. Kevin, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon. I'm Kevin. I'm joined here by Brian Adams. Now, sort of the genesis for this talk is there's really been a lot of interesting things going on in the last 10 or 15 years in causal inference. And I also think a lot of very interesting things going on in introductory statistics education. And it seems like maybe a few more things from causal inference could trickle down into the introductory statistics course. I want to talk a little bit about um, why we should maybe be talking about some of them and what they are. Um, I also think that a lot of the ways of thinking and a lot of the modes of thinking in causal inference contribute very well to the types of thinking that we would like students to do in the introductory course. Uh, just a few acknowledgments before we get started, I'd like to thank our colleagues here at West Point for their help with this. Also, we use uh, Introduction to Statistical Investigations by uh, Tintel and all, uh, so you'll see a lot of their influence in this, and also Michael Kahn, who first came up with the data set that we are using for our example. Uh, also, a quick disclaimer is that uh, this is not an introductory course in causal inference. We really wanted to keep sort of the true to the promise of these are some things that you could talk about within an introductory course. And so if you're expecting an introductory course on causal inference, that's not this. We're trying to say what can you do in an introductory course about or talking about causal inference. Okay. So here's a quick agenda. I will give a brief overview of some aspects of causal inference just to kind of get us on the same page. I will not say that these are the things that we should be teaching our students, but just to give you a little bit of more depth in the area on causal inference if you're not familiar with it. And then go into the bulk of the presentation, which is um, why should we be talking about causal inference, what and how. So frequently one of the things that we want to do in statistics is uh, measure the effect of something. In this case, I'm a biostatistician, so I usually say our treatment. So we want to measure the effect of our treatment A on some outcome Y. And so for example, and I'll use this example throughout the talk today, I might want to know the effect of a college degree on future earnings as an adult. And this is something that even I think our students would be interested in. And of course, I could come up with a measure of association between having a college degree um, and future earnings. For example, just calculate the mean earnings of folks that went to college and subtract the mean earnings of those that didn't, and that's a measure of association. However, for conducting an observational study, uh, that measure of association is subject to confounding. There are other variables out there that are both, that are common causes of both uh, getting a college degree and future earnings. In this case, a good example would be parent socioeconomic status. Um, students from higher socioeconomic status are probably more likely to attend college, and regardless of whether or not they attended college, are likely to have higher future earnings. But very frequently what we want to do in statistics is take data that we've gotten from an observational study and estimate what the effect would be in a world where I intervened and changed somebody's college degree, switching them from having not had a college degree to having them a college degree. In other words, measuring some causal effect of attending college. Uh, one way to think about this is I want to take data in a world that I see the data, an observational study, and estimate something in a world that I do and I intervene on the variable and change something about it. And so you actually, uh, we can't express causal effects just purely in terms of standard conditional probability notation. And one of the first things that's been done in this field is, and this was done uh, 30, 40 years ago, is come up with notation for causal effects. So maybe it's just a quick background on the notation for causal effects. Uh, the most common and popular one is the potential outcomes framework of Rubin. 
uh, if you have a binary treatment, so this was the case here, either you went to college or you did not go to college, each person has two potential outcomes. There's the potential outcome if the person went to college. So I have Brian next to me. So I have, Brian's got two potential outcomes. If Brian went to college, that's his out, potential outcome when he was treated. And if I could also observe Brian when he didn't go to college, that would be his potential outcome uh, when he's untreated. And so we could define the average causal effect as just the difference. And if I could observe everybody having gone to college in the population and subtract, if I could observe everybody not having gone to college in the population, that is the average causal effect. There's also other systems out there for uh, annotating causal effects. I'm not going to cover uh, the one Judea Pearls, but you'll see it out there. So just to complete our, our chart here is we now think of the causal effect as the expected value of Y1 minus the expected value of Y0. The whole population observed going to college and the whole population observed not going to college. This sort of leads to, as you can imagine, the fundamental problem in causal inference, which is that you cannot observe both potential outcomes for each individual. I can't observe Brian having gone to college and Brian not having gone to college, which means that in an observational study, I cannot directly observe the causal effect. All I can observe is for some percentage of the population, their wages that went to college, and then for some other pop elements in the population, subjects in the population, uh, their wages, and they didn't go to college. However, however, and this is important, that sometimes when certain conditions are met, we can identify causal effects from things we can observe. And a particularly helpful um, thing in these cases is our causal diagrams. So I'm going to talk a little bit about causal diagrams and then uh, transition to the part about what we conclude in intro stats courses. So a key idea here is that I want to know when I can I want to know when I can estimate causal effects from observational data. And so if I have a causal diagram, a causal diagram is going to contain all common causes of both the treatment and outcome. So the most simple causal diagram would be A is a cause of Y and there's no other common causes of them both out there. So this would be the case of a randomized experiment. Any variable that's related to A in the population is no longer going to be associated because we've randomized it. Some other basic building blocks would be confounding. So this example here shows there's no causal effect of A on Y, but there's going to be an association from A on Y from the confounder X. So for example, let's just say um, college had no effect on adult earnings, and the only association that we observe is from the confounder so parent socioeconomic status. And so no causal effect here, but I observe an association between A and Y because of the confounder X. We frequently annotate adjusting for or stratifying or conditioning upon a variable by putting a box around it. And we say it blocks the flow of association from A to Y. In other words, after conditioning upon X, we no longer observe any association here between A and Y. Figure three shows probably the second major building block of a causal diagram, which is a collider. Colliders are variables that are caused by both the treatment and the outcome. An example that uh, is in Pearl, Judea Pearl's Book of Why, that's a really good illustration of this, is if A is beauty in the population and Y is talent, we'd have no expectation that um, beauty and talent are related to each other. More beautiful people, I don't think, are more talented than everybody else. Um, however, they're both common causes of becoming a Hollywood actor. And so if I condition upon that, that opens a flow of association. So once I condition upon that, once I only look at Hollywood actors, I would expect to see an association between A and Y only amongst Hollywood actors. If I know a Hollywood actor is not beautiful, I would expect them to be uh, more talented. And that example is in uh, Judea Pearl's Book of Why. A uh, fourth building block is a mediator. So this is the effect of A on Y is mediated by some variable X. So for example, if this A is college education and X is attendance to, for example, law school, if all of the effect of attending college is through attending law school on adult wages, then it would be completely mediated by X. And once we condition upon X, that blocks the effect, the causal effect of A on Y. 
So using these very simple diagrams, we can actually identify very quickly if we can, um, we can actually see very quickly if we can identify causal effects in a particular observational study. Um, so for example, um, so here's the specific criteria. We can identify causal effects when there are no backdoor paths between treatment and outcome. And two, if you've measured sufficient confounders to block any backdoor paths. So let me just kind of orient you to the, the figure I have. If you follow this example we've been talking about, uh, is college education, does college education have an effect on adult wages? Well, we might speculate that um, age is related to this. If we have an observational study, perhaps older people were more likely to go to college and in general, older folks in certain age groups are gonna have higher adult wages. A 50 year old probably has a higher wage than the typical 25 year old. And so these variables represent ones that are all common causes of um, college and adult wages. And so a way to check if you can identify in a particular study, if these variables are sufficient uh, to identify a causal effect is to determine if there's any backdoor paths from college to adult wages. And so the first step would be to remove any arrows coming out of college and then see if there's any backdoor paths. And so in this case, there's multiple backdoor paths through age, gender, and parent socioeconomic status. And after conditioning upon these variables, I would be able to identify a causal effect between college and adult wages, assuming that there are no other additional common causes of these that are not included in the diagram here. And this, these set of criteria is known as the backdoor path criterion. So a quick review of what I've talked about in terms of causal inference, and I'll get into more what we should, what we can be talking about in intro courses. In causal inference, the goal is to estimate the effect of intervening on one variable, in our example, college, on another variable, adult wages. Um, sometimes we can estimate this effect from observational data. And I think a very key part of causal inference and something that we'll talk about more in the next section is that it requires the investigator to specify their assumptions about the causality in their model, basically to specify causal assumptions. They're developing a model and then assessing that model. And so typically what's done is that these causal assumptions are specified before collecting data using expert knowledge. And lastly, from this brief introduction to causal inference is that from causal diagrams, using a set of very simple to follow rules, you can tell if causal effects are identifiable. And those are the two criteria right there. Okay, so now to the, the uh, main part of the presentation. So why causal inference in introductory statistics? And I think a great place to start when you're talking anything introductory statistics is the gaze report. It's a great point of departure from, from, uh, for conversation. And so I'm gonna assume that most of you are familiar with the gaze report. The citations down there at the bottom. I would like to highlight a couple parts of it. One is this notion of the investigative process and that we should be giving our students experience with the entire investigative process from asking research questions to designing studies to collecting data to interpreting their results and looking ahead and, and forward to what they would do next. And also the emphasis recently that was put in the last gaze report on multivariable um, thinking. And so keep those in mind as I go through a few reasons here why I think causal inference and parts of it has a place in introductory statistics. Um, one is, I think when we ask causal questions, so like what is the effect of college education on adult earnings, I think that those kind of questions develop higher level thinking than more simple questions of is there an association between these two variables specifically because it actually requires you to look at the whole investigative process when you're doing it. So a quick maybe example of this, we've been talking about this example of um, college degree and adult wages. So what you see on the plot here is uh, these are wages, this is taken from the Tintel text, um, weekly wages of adult males. And this is the Giving this to a student and asking them, is there an association between these two variables is a relatively straightforward um, question in terms of the level of thinking that it requires. 
And it's largely a matter of what's the difference between these means and is that difference um, big enough to be meaningful, like practically significant, and would we expect this to be kind of robust? Is there statistical significance? Would we expect to observe it again? Um, but asking a slightly different question, a slightly different question than is there an association between the two? And instead asking is there an effect of one on the other? Is there a causal relationship? Really forces you to consider very broader um, aspects. What was the study design? How was the data collected? How was the data analyzed? And I think our, one of our arguments here is that this develops a higher level of thinking than um, just looking at associations between two things. Um, reason number two is that it really requires, so one of the big emphasis of introductory courses is multivariable thinking to understand that third or fourth or fifth variables have um, and changed the relationship between two variables. Uh, this is very um, integral to causal inference, which is we would kind of expect that as our students look at does college degree have an effect on adult earnings, that there's a bunch of other variables that they would want to consider and take into consideration. And they would want to very finely specify what they think the relationship is between these. Uh, so reason number three, I think causal diagrams are just really, really powerful tools. And I find myself hard to get away from them. They're really very really powerful tools for structuring multivariable thinking. This is the causal diagram that we discussed before. And there's a lot that students can take from building a diagram like this and a lot that they can sort of help to structure their initial thinking of how these things could be related to, um, to each other. Um, reason four is that if even if when you're talking about concepts that are not necessarily non-causal in nature, the um, causal diagrams are very helpful for illustrating these concepts. And so, for example, if you were to do a randomization test and you were to randomize, try to, if you're doing a randomization test and you're building the null distribution by randomizing your, um, your treatment, you'd be breaking the link between your treatment and any confounders out there. And you're also breaking the link between your treatment and the outcome. You could also illustrate a randomized controlled experiment, which is when you randomize levels of treatment, then you're breaking the link between confounders and any um, treatment variables out there. Uh, reason five is that is correlation does not imply causation. This is still really, really good advice for students and we should be telling them still to be skeptical of making causal conclusions from observational data. But I feel like there's a whole lot more that our discipline has to say about causal inference above and beyond just correlation does not imply causation. So that's why, so what about causal inference could make its way into intro stats? I think first is very precisely defining what the difference is between association and causation. And I think of association as being what we can see. So I see in my data, I see in observational data, a relationship between having a college degree and adult earnings. Whereas causal is more of I do or I, intervene on something. If I was to change, if I was to go and tell a bunch of people to get a college degree, what would I expect the effect to be on their um, adult wages? Uh, so topic two that I think could make its way into intro courses is confounding. You know, this goes hand in hand with multivariable thinking. There's a lot of examples out there that students can understand. So for example, uh, what's the effect of drinking coffee on your exam grades? Well, there might be an effect of coffee on exam grades, or there might be an association that goes through sleep, as in sleep is more likely to make you uh, drink coffee, and sleep, or lack thereof, I'm sorry, lack of sleep will make you drink more coffee, and lack of sleep will probably uh, decrease your exam grade. Or another great example is, is there an effect of the number of bedrooms on the value of your home? And if you observe, if you look at data, typically the number of bedrooms, as the number of bedrooms increases, as the number of bedrooms increases, the price of the house increases. However, once you look within the similar size of houses, if you look only within small houses or only within medium-sized houses, there's no longer an effect of increasing the number of bedrooms. In other words, once you look at the house of the same size, increasing the number of bedrooms does not make the, increase the value of the home. 
Uh, topic number three, I think causal diagrams are a really, really powerful way for structuring multivariable thinking. And including these, whenever you talk about the relationship between two variables is a really um, great way for students to structure their multivariable thinking. Topic four is methods for confounding adjustment. So in a really basic course, you could just stratify on the confounding variables. So only look at um, the effect of college on adult wages within certain strata of parental income or some other confounding variable. For more advanced courses, you could use multiple regression or you could do some uh, matching schemes. So that's the uh, why some causal inference in intro, intro courses and what topics. And so the last thing I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and Brian's going to discuss um, how. So I'm going to present you uh, one example on how, we're, how we've done this in our course. Um, so what I'm going to use is our six steps to statistical investigation that's outlined in the textbook we use, Introduction to Statistical Analysis. So the problem we like to use has to deal with smoking and uh, its effects on lug capacity. So we like this problem because students generally have some understanding of how these things might um, affect each other. It's, but in this data set, it, it's of children, so there are ranges from age 3 to 18. And so the very first thing we do after presenting them a small scenario about the data set is we, at, we tell them to ask a research question. Most of them will kind of get to what is the effect of smoking on lung function in young people. Um, after they get a good research question, we move on to designing a study and collecting data. And so we ask them, is this an observational study or an experiment? And this is an observational study, and this is where most books will always point out that an observational study, you know, association does not imply causation. But we want to push a little bit further. How can we make them think, you know, with this observational study, what can we look at? So more of that, if I did something, what would happen? Um, next, we want them to get this multivariable thinking. So if you were to conduct this study, what variables would you record? And so this is nice because now the students will start talking to each other. Um, a lot of them will come up with uh, some pretty interesting variables, even some that I might not have thought of in the past. But ultimately, we do have to kind of bring them back in to what variables we have accessible. And so we end up giving them these uh, five variables that are in the data set. And obviously, smoking is our, is our explanatory variable. And FEV is our response variable. After we spend time talking about what data you would like to look at, then we move on to uh, drawing that causal diagram. And so we have them do is we have them first decide, you know, here's my explanatory variable smoke and how does that affect my response variable FEV? And then we have them just start, you know, how do these other variables fit in? Um, age is usually one that they usually go right to. I think they all understand the older you are, the more likely you are to smoke and the older you are, uh, the larger your lungs are. Uh, the same will go on with gender. So again, uh, male, males and females, uh, males generally have a larger lung capacity, and then, you know, there can be arguments made for gender's impact on your likelihood uh, of smoking. Uh, but then the next one that's rather interesting is height. And so height now, you know, males are typically taller, the taller you are, uh, the, I mean, the older you are, the taller you are, as well as your height, and will certainly impact your uh, lung capacity. But where do they think uh, does smoking relate to height? Um, does smoking uh, affect your height? And so what we like them to do here is just really discuss where they think this fits in. Um, and what we like to kind of point out now, if you were to adjust on height and you're really interested in this effect right here, if this was your, your coefficient, you're going to be losing some of that effect uh, through height because it has, now has two paths to get to lung capacity. And what we want to look at is when you're making your model, um, you really need to be careful to decide on what would you like to adjust on. Um, so next we have them like, all right, now you're looking at it. Uh, what, what should you end up identifying as confounding variables? And the diagram uh, allows them to uh, quickly pick up on it just because of the, most students are pretty visual. And so here in this case, we would argue that, you know, sex and age are confounding variables. And ultimately, because, you know, height is not a confounding variable and we're all ultimately interested in smoking and its effect on lung capacity, we probably would not want to include that in the model. And so we hope that our students eventually arrive at this final causal diagram uh, before they make their models. Uh, next, we like to use tidyverse uh, in our studio um, to help our students uh, visualize the data. We think this is an important step uh, in the uh, statistical investigation. 
And this one is pretty fun because the very first plot they always will make is this side-by-side -side box plot where they quickly see that I need to start smoking so that I can increase my lung capacity. Um, but obviously this is that association between the two. So next we ask them, now let's take a look at those variables you thought were confounding variables and create some more graphs. So here you'll see age and lung capacity. And it's pretty clear as the, the older you are, the, big, the bigger your lung capacity, but you start seeing the blue dots are starting to generally fall below. Um, another one we can have them do is just based off gender comparing uh, that lung capacity and the lung capacity if you smoke or not. Uh, then we get to what models. And so in our course, we do build multiple linear regression models in our introductory course. Um, but we like this because this really sees what happens if you do not adjust for those confounding variables. So in the first model they always make is a simple linear regression model. And in this case, if we didn't adjust for age and sex, we would see that smoke, smoking actually, according to this model, would increase your lung capacity. And of course, there's a very small p-value. And this just kind of shows what you can start asking is like, well, why is this case? And you can refer back to your causal diagram that maybe it was because I didn't adjust for something. So when we move into making, and it, where we adjust for age and sex in a multiple linear regression model, we start seeing that now our coefficient is negative, which is what most of us would have expected from the beginning. And there is some statistical significance associated with it. Um, but again, building this model is pretty easy to do after you go through the thought process of, bu of building that causal diagram. Uh, the next model you could do is, is make it a matched model. And so in this matched model, we're matching on age and sex. And then we're this way, it's really adjusting for that age and sex. And when we make that model, we'll see again that the smoking has a negative uh, impact on lung capacity. And so in this model, we're actually um, finding the average treatment of the effect in the treated. Uh, but now there's a different p-value. So if I was looking at all these all together, you know, now our students have you know, three different models that they can kind of compare and see how does that smoking actually affect lung capacity. Uh, then we have them go on to formulate their conclusions. You know, is our result statistically significant? But we also like to focus on, is it practically significant? What is that size of that effect? Um, next, we always like to push them at the very end to say, look back and ahead. Were there other confounding variables that we did not record in the experiment that we should have considered in the analysis? And just a few of those that they, they, they've came up with before is, you know, diet and physical activity. Okay, so just that's our last slide here. So you can find the materials for the lab. We have both instructor notes and the lab at uh, this GitHub site, and we'll have a paper coming out uh, soon. Should be any should be pretty soon. And also uh, joint work right now going on with Shonda Kuiper. She has a series of games, and this one we're looking at building a causal lab based on uh, her Defenders game. That's in the works right now. Lab's not available yet, but it should be. Um, shortly. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending today. And uh, are there any questions? Um, indeed. So thank you very much to both of you for your presentation today. And uh, if any of you who are listening have some questions, go ahead and type them into the questions box. Uh, we have one from Dean Poeth who says, in your class, do you ask the students how they could convert an observational study into a controlled experiment? Yeah, I think the talking about a, a controlled experiment is a nice way of thinking about causality. Um, so yes, we would we would do that. And I think it's, it'd be really nice if we get to like inverse probability of treatment weighting, and then you sort of see how you're building this pseudo population, which is another way of, of sort of building some visual intuition of causality. Uh, that is sometimes a bridge too far for an intro course, but it'd be really nice to get there. Um, Nick Horton wants to know if you have a link to your in progress paper because <laughs> he thinks it looks great. I will, I will send, I will send him a link. Um, and then is this topic good for stat major undergraduate students or for all types of undergraduate students, do you think? Yeah, so it's really scalable. I think that 
if you're talking an intro intro course the methods that you use to adjust for confounding i think you select carefully so for example if you're talking the the basic stack course then i think just stratifying on your confounder and redoing the analysis like doing a two sample t-test after stratifying on your confounder is probably a great way to go then for a more advanced first course or a second course then you could do the regression i find matching is just a very very intuitive way for students to understand causality because you're essentially building this new data set where your treated and untreated groups look the same based on the confounders in other words like you have people that went to college and didn't go to college that have similar um, parents social economic status So my question in all of this is, where do you introduce this? I mean, is this something that you talk about from the very beginning? Where, and you say you, you do multiple linear regression in your course. Do you wait until you get to multiple linear regression to talk about causality? Or is this something that you talk about all the way through? No, so we usually start like using informally introducing causal diagram. So informal at first. So anytime you talk about the relationship between, so even when you start with doing two sample t-tests and you want to say like, is this effect due to whatever, whatever your explanatory variable of interest is? And then you say, well, there's other variables out there. And so always building um, these causal diagrams, but being very informal at first. And then as the semester progresses, then slowly start introducing more um, formal rules of it. So let's say I, when you get to multiple regression, then you they've gotten used to seeing these causal diagrams and you say, okay, well really what we wanna do is we wanna include, include variables that are confounders on this quote unquote backdoor path, include those in our regression model. And it's actually makes, I think makes for a nice motivation for regression. You know, why do I wanna put more variables in my model? Well, you know, if I'm doing prediction type applications, then it's to explain more variation. But if you're doing a, a, a like an association study or a causal kind of application, then you're adding other variables in the model to adjust for them because they're confounders. And so I think it, it starts informal and then it slowly builds more formally and multiple regression is probably the time where you where you make the rules very formal, but it's built throughout the semester. And if, like the, uh, for example, the, Introduction to Statistical Investigations, the Tintle text, has a lot of very informal diagrams where they diagram these out and then, then we kind of make them a little bit more formal towards the end of the semester. Okay. Um, Nick Horton also wants to know, I think that it's really important to teach these topics in our introductory statistics courses, if only because students are now seeing more standard bivariate comparisons in high schools. Stratification and matching are great topics that are straightforward. His question is, what has been most challenging for your students in all of this? Yeah, I think some of it is, is the technology bit. So if you want to do, if you want to do multi-variable comparisons quickly, we use, we use Tidyverse in R. You know, ideally we want students to be able to kind of in our mind, what we're thinking is that they posit this model using, like they're taught, in my mind, like the vision I have is like students in class, like in pods, kind of like discussing these models, like what, what variables affect what, and they build this model, and then they go to the data, and they look at the data, and they're looking through these relationships. Well, they can get caught up very quickly in some of the technology aspects, and we're trying to work on, on that through Tidyverse. I know there's a ton of other resources out there that are probably more uh, point and click than, for example, R would be. But I think the technology bit is probably the biggest the biggest challenge. Okay. And then one last question from Tulia Rivera says, how is the methodology? Do you do this in class, in groups, individual work, or homework? The particular lab I would recommend doing in groups. I think it's we usually do these by starting um, the students in class in groups of two. And they start in class. That way the instructor's there to kind of get over some of the initial hurdle. They begin the, we kind of do it as like a guided lab approach. Um, they work in class and then take it home and finish it 
um, outside of class, typically in groups of in groups of two. Okay. Well, again, thanks to both of you for this great presentation. A lot of interesting things to talk to for us to think about. Um, thanks to everyone for attending. We do have some other webinars planned in the upcoming months, so I encourage you to keep your eye on the CAUSE website or on the uh, emails and sign up for them. And uh, again, thanks to you and hope everyone has a really nice day. All right, thank you very much.